if it takes you 20 years to create that beautiful place that you want to create, th those houses are going to probably be old, and then you have to build some new ones anyway. And I will <clears throat> add, Stephen, that it's LISC's experience. I mean, we've been around for over 35 years. Um, we have spent, I think, a, invested a billion dollars with a B last year in low-income communities ac across the country. And we overwhelmingly support low-income. We never would think that low-income housing, 50 units or 100 units, would ever reduce a median income to somewhere that is measurable. Um, what it also does is add volume and add um, and oftentimes in places like Kansas City, where we don't have, we didn't build up, we built out, it adds um, units, it adds people with purchasing power, which is a secondary look at when you're talking about a grocery store in the urban core. It's not just about median income, it's about how many people are there. And so if you, know, if you, you could build 300 units, you're, what you're saying is your income's gonna stay the same in Kansas City, Kansas, but you're gonna add a whole lot more purchasing power because those people are gonna be spending money locally in your stores and we can sh we've seen the you know, statistics on how, what they generate for the local income from federal taxes they create jobs they do all they have all these ripple effects so i guess i would argue that we're overwhelmingly supportive we think the evidence is out there we ask you all to go out and look at omb and you know the evidence is overwhelming this is one of the most successful pro uh, pro uh, programs in the government's history um, and we firmly believe that it is necessary to kind of turn around an area that has had so much disinvestment that no one's going to come there unless you have something new and shiny to attract them. I would, hey. Well, and I, I wanted to get to Commissioner Marghia's question because she did present that last time. So I looked at the, uh, the policy and that's why we sent it out. We also included on this knowing we'd had the presentation about from the, the list folks coming here, but then also if, if you chose to get into the policy any tonight. Um, when we developed this policy about 10 years ago, um, we actually, th there's an interesting point within it that gets into the need for the affordable housing in different areas, and we divided out six different districts within the community. And what that actually was kind of looked at it from the opposite perspective because it said, where do we not have affordable housing now? And the two areas that came up were, one you would guess would be the more the Piper area, and the other one that came into the area was in the Turner-Muncie area, which you wouldn't think as much would pop out from that, but that's where it showed you those projects. That actually was an opportunity to score points, but I think, and I haven't had legal get into it, but this was a criteria we just put forth to look at it when we were developing this policy back then to say, okay, here's a data center we can go to and put this information in. I think we can, I think it's every bit our own right in developing our policy to come back to this and say, here's the area of the community that we've determined there is adequate affordable housing today. And we either want to put a negative point value if somebody brings a project to it to come into that area, or you could put a, uh, we do have some pre-qualifiers that just say if you come to this area, we're not going to approve it. I think, I don't know about that option, but you could do it to say we built, and that way we're not kind of doing a blanket over the whole city. You're coming to specific areas and saying, these are areas we already feel like there's adequate affordable housing in place. And if you propose a project in this geographic area, you'll have a negative 10 points on your score. And I think that gets you down the direction you're going but still leaves our program open to come into other areas where we determine that we think we do want to have affordable housing. I would second that motion. <laughs> I, I need to do a little bit more follow-up on that, and maybe one of the four staff attorneys we have here in the office can assist me with that. <laughs> you guys were all in on this tonight, weren't you? Everybody showed up. Um, but, you know, we went into, we really researched this a lot last time we, we went through it and dug into it from a, legal perspective as to what we thought we could defend. And, uh, you know, we're having worked on it back then, I think this is a criteria we could work on. And I don't think we want to be, it's an absolute no, but I think it could, just like we put different balancing criteria that added points, if somebody added amenities to certain areas, there's different things you can do about this. It's our policy. We just have to be uniform in how we apply it later but you can have different 
and uniforms still can be different criteria for different areas. I mean, we gave more points if somebody was close to transportation. So if you were further away, you didn't score as well. Or obviously you score more points when you take out or replace existing housing in a certain area. You know, if you revitalize an old building that was burnt out or just something like that, you would score better. <coughs> Yeah, and uh, Doug, I would agree with, with both of your comments, um, the gentleman from LISC and, and yourself, that, that um, in older urban neighborhoods, we do have an aging housing stock. And we do need to address that issue. I mean, I think countywide. Um, I, I do think we need to, to take a look at that. And that's why la in the last meeting, the other thing that we discussed was the replacement. So, for example, I'm just... Don't anybody uh, think that I am using a real example, because I'm not. I'm just making this up. Um, but let's say we have an apartment complex that is old and dilapidated and run down um, and was providing housing for low-income families. Um, if there was um, a way to incent a developer to come in to acquire that property and demolish that and build new using LIHTC, meeting the needs of that same population, I have no objection to that. Because I do think there needs to be a plan to to get rid of some of this older housing stock that that really isn't good housing stock for anyone to live in, that people are currently living in. Um, so I think that is one strategy. And, and Commissioner Townsend, that's why I said in development, whether it's housing or commercial, you have to have lots of flexibility. Um, so there should be no absolutes. Um, I definitely wouldn't want an absolute that you could never do a LIHTC project in District 3. But I want to have the ability to deny LIHTC in District 3. So I think, you're, I think what you said, Doug, is, is good feedback. I think it's a good starting point where you lose, I would say, 20 points <laughs> if you build a light tech deal in District 3 without, unless it's replacement. And if it's replacement, I'd give them 20 points. So again, that's just, I'm speaking, it's hard, I know. We're trying to set policy for an entire county when that's very difficult because everybody's district is very different and has different needs. And so I, I feel very passionate about it. Obviously, it's very upsetting to me, <laughs> I'll just tell you. Um, but I don't want my own personal opinions of this kind of housing product to get in the way of Brian's progress or your progress, or anyone's for that matter. Well, my hope for where this discussion would go is kind of like just where you just went. Here's a criterion on which we could change our current scoring scale that might make a meaningful difference in terms of putting projects that we believe are good in place and keeping projects that we don't believe are good out of place. I, I think you just articulated a potential change to our scoring scale that would have a meaningful difference on this. Mm -hmm. So that's where I hope that we could go with this, with the information that Mr. Brockman gave you, with the information that Doug and other staff can bring back for next month, with the information provided by LISC here tonight, that we can start thinking about how can we use our scoring tool to make sure that development happens in the right way. So that would be my goal for us, is to bring back that discussion. Okay. What might be helpful for staff, uh, this is just a suggestion, is, Doug, it, and I know your time and staff is limited, but to meet with the commissioners individually um, and get feedback from them about what their long-term vision is for their district and where they would like to see housing go within their district and to find some common ground amongst the commission. Again, I'm not opposed to talking about it. I just think that's a more efficient way to come forward with some potential changes to the policy. I, I, I would agree with that because yeah. I think really to get into the what, what you see from the policymaker in that area, you know, we probably need to have that one-on-one -on -one discussion. And it may, we may need to have more areas than six for something like yeah. this, you know, that, that comes into play now because it, there may be a section of your area and you say, I don't think this fits into this area, but over here, I mean, and granted, they're not, uh, the way it's divided up now, obviously it's not divided by district, 
because we divided it by six. It's not divided by eight. We didn't go into it from that perspective. We were really looking at some geographic breakouts. I honestly can't remember why we came up with those dividing lines, how they broke out today, but you know, I think that would play into it. And then we may have more areas to divide into too. So with that the case then, what we seems like we should do here is wait for staff then to come back to us, drive this point forward when they are ready to come back and either bring information or facilitate the discussion, we have it. Until then, we don't. Be great. Charles, is there any reason anyone would be coming to us <clears throat> would need an endorsement on part of the unified government in the next couple of months? Uh, yes, sir. There's a LIHTC project coming through for approval. I thought the state's deadline I mean, the, the state's deadline is passed. Right. And they have the opportunity if the state elects to go with the summer award program. Well, so this is somebody wanting to get theirs done now. Yeah. Correct. We we go through the application process year round, and they had contacted the state already, and they said that it's going to be lagging, but if it gets there prior to them announcing awards, they'll go ahead and accept the application. Well. Well, again, I mean, I think we can't, I don't think we should assume that this particular project is, would be something that the commission would be opposed to. I think if you would go ahead, if we would go ahead and follow through with the same process, even though we're in the process of amending the criteria, I think we're probably in good shape. Am I wrong? I, I guess, and Jody, I'd probably ask you to come up on this. Is there a, an opportunity for us if we wanted to suspend our program I mean knowing that especially if we have someone coming through and maybe you have to look at this but if if we were to say we just we're not going to offer our recommendation on a project until we go through and reevaluate our criteria for the next 90 days I mean with some time frame now I would say based on what Charles has said that obviously could adversely affect that specific project but I would have to research whether they would have a cause of action against us for that. Um, we have a policy in place, but I, we probably could suspend it. But since their application was already in to us, we might be obligated to, um, to consider it under the current policy. Only one in at this time, Charles? Uh, yes, sir, and it's not the city application, it's the pre-development meeting prior to submitting an application which was adopted previously uh, on an amended plan. I guess maybe what I would recommend is rather than dig into whether we have a legal issue or whatever that may or may not be contested is that we would take the one project, continue to work it through as we normally would, but if the governing body would provide direction back to Charles or staff that we would just suspend our program for 90 days while we work it and if anybody else comes in, we tell them we are suspended while we evaluate it. That would be fair. That would be fine. Do we need That's to take fair. action on that? Make I think a it would be good to get a, a vote from you all on that. Okay. So you make a motion to suspend our LIHTC policy for the next 90 days. Pending yeah. policy potential revisions. With the exception with, of the one project that's already, for projects that already aren't already in, have been Have already been those. submitted. Second. That is a motion? Yes. Okay. And there is a second. There's a motion and a second to suspend our current program for 90 days pending revisions, but to work the one application that has already been received. Roll call, please. Roll call, Alvin. Aye. Walters. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the information. Yeah, Thank actually, you. my business cards in there. I'd love them to get to know the others that I haven't met yet. So if anyone wants to reach out, I'll do the same, by the way. I would, I would appreciate seeing your districts. Thanks. That takes care of item number one under our outcomes menu. The other item is the item that was the pink sheet. It was also an addition, not part of the original uh, agenda, 
but I was reminded that we had said that we would come back and revisit this discussion again at this meeting. We had a discussion in our last meeting about the possibility of the unified government becoming a lender in certain situations and for certain projects. And we had said that we would consider some of the framework of how that might look if we were to do that and bring that back for discussion right now. And so that is our next item. And Mr. Bach, do you have yeah. anything on that? Okay. I do. Um, before I turn this over to, Lor to uh, Lou and George to give us all the answers here to make this work for everybody. Um, I, I will say, bringing this in today, we're looking at it from a perspective of a project without bringing the specific project here. Because the, the objective here was, how can we do this unified government loan program in the sense that it's one where we as a government could actually see the fruits of actual additional revenue coming in place from the interest rate overage that we could charge to somebody, you know, to come to and say, okay, it's an economic development loan. It's tied to a specific project that'll come into play. The project most likely, or we believe will go out and could find other financing, but they could more easily do the financing through us and would allow us to charge a, a premium on it and make an amount of money. And that, that's kind of the discussion to get into. So um, I don't, didn't bring it with a specific project, and we didn't bring it, I don't think, from a perspective to say if we were to do something like this, we'd want to have, I, I don't think we'd need to set out a bunch of parameters around it and work it to that great detail because I would just say if you gave me the parameters to do this that said this is the objective for which you could solve by, and maybe that's in a certain amount of money, then like any other economic development deal, we'd go out and work it and try to bring back the necessary safeguards tied to it that gave you that protection. Now, that being said, I asked Lou to dig into this and, and go through it and, and probably give me his analysis of it if it said it's not a project, we don't need it in order to make the project happen, then what's your opinion on it if we're doing it in order to make money? And 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 I'll let Lou speak for himself, but I think he has a lot of cautionary points that come to mind, especially after being uh, grilled for several hours this week and working on bond ratings and such like that as to things that can come into play. So Lou, would you, you want to go through the points that you came up with on this? little background on how I approached it. I, I guess the questions I asked myself, I said, one, can we structure such a program for this purpose? Do we have the legal authority to actually uh, move forward with such a program? Uh, reviewed, reviewed these questions with bond counsel and, and determined the following, following. We could issue general obligation bonds for economic development purposes. So we would have to, the government would have to take action we could issue geo debt, and we and we would say we would be doing it under our home rule authority for economic development purposes. Uh, the, the government has the ability; we could have it enter into a development agreement with the potential developer, and we could charge an interest rate that would be above the interest rate of the debt we would issue. So we would have that authority. Um, debt would be issued on a taxable basis, and reason it would be on a taxable basis is we would be making a payment for private use to the developer and we would require private payments back from the developer to us. And so if it's if the debt's issued on a taxable basis, maybe that interest spread difference between what the developer could get under private financing and what we would get the debt would be narrowed. Um, the debt would count against the government's debt burden. Uh, what uh, Doug alluded to was uh, the credit calls that I've just went through, and, and our existing level of debt was raised by both of the credit agencies that reviewed our debt, where we are in terms of debt today. So, so my, my first conclusion is yes, we could do such a program. We could structure such a program. Um, my concerns about such a program is that, uh, one, um, on our capital program today, we, we've, we've set a debt threshold, and 
we actually adopted a debt policy uh, just recently in this committee, and we said on an annual basis, in the, sh in the interim period where our finances are today, we want to limit our debt on an annual basis to approximately 12 to $15 million. So if we were to issue debt, I'll say for a loan to a developer, of, uh, and for round numbers, I'll use the amount 1.2 million, we would be using up 10% of our debt capacity approximately, and that would limit our ability to do other capital projects. So, so that, that's one concern. Uh, the, the second is any additional debt, it adds to our debt burden. And, and when we have discussions with uh, our credit agencies, they, they, they look at the type of debt we're issuing, and they say, is it essential debt for the government? They like to see debt that's for street improvements, for uh, sanitary sewers. They want to see basic governmental service debt. They're, um, they understand that uh, communities may enter into debt for economic development purposes, but they want to clearly see what's the revenue stream associated with that, that debt and our ability to, to pay back that debt if it's tied to an economic development project. Um, what, what, our, what we would potentially earn would be on this, what I'm going to call the interest spread. So, so let's say we did this debt, we issued debt of approximately $1.2 million, and uh, we, the cost of that debt, and we'll say it's on a, a short-term period, a three- to five-year period, and the developer uh, makes a, in a, we enter into a development agreement, and the developer is willing to pay us say a 5% charge for issuing that debt to him. At the same time, we, we may issue that debt, we're issuing it on a taxable basis, and we may be able, depending on the market, issue that uh, short-term debt for, uh, with cost of issuance at maybe 2% or even 3% less than what we're, um, what, what we're gonna get from the developer. So, 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 let, so let's say, uh, I'll split the difference and say, say we're able to issue it at 2, 2.5% two less. So we're issuing debt for a little over a million dollars, and what the revenue we're going to get back on an annual basis is going to be somewhere twenty five dollars to $30,000. So we're going to issue debt for a project that hopefully, you know, is going to succeed if it doesn't succeed, we're putting over a million dollars at risk for our ability to generate income, twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. That that level, that high level of risk, from my, from the seat I sit in, concerns me. Um, I, where where I, I where I think uh, supporting a development is meaningful is. Is this a, is the development a project that the government wants to support? And then we want to, then we can look at making available to the developer our, our various tools. And maybe it is supporting a, a loan. For example, um, uh, in, on, on the uh, Metropolitan Avenue development, we, we issue general obligation bond debt, and it's backed by project revenues. We, uh, we have some level of certainty because the, that particular project, the developer, uh, we know there's a revenue stream. We have the save a lot store initially. We have Dollar General, and so we know there's property tax and sales tax revenue. So, so we have some confidence of a revenue stream. But it was the project that the, that uh, this committee and the commission felt had, from a policy standpoint, it was necessary to enter into. So um, I know we're, we're looking at uh, a downtown grocery store. If that's a project that uh, the commission feels is important to the community, to me, then that's the time where we want to provide financial support. I guess my concern is, do we want to provide uh, a loan where, where the main purpose of the loan is to to receive that interest spread differential, we're reducing uh, monies that might be available for other capital projects, and um, and and I really think potentially there's a, there's the projects could be at risk. 
uh, you know, uh, certain projects less risk than others. Uh, we, we've certainly seen over the years uh, a residential project that the developer has high intentions for and the project doesn't go forward or it doesn't gen move as fast as, as it has. And uh, I just, um, I guess that's my overall view on this proposal. I, I will probably offer that, you know, I think Lou and I look at it, I mean, there's different perspectives because certainly from an administrative perspective, the financial concerns that Lou lays, lays on the table lead me to believe why would we get into this business at all. The, the economic development side of me gets to it to say, well, there is some opportunity to, to leverage some financial, some revenues that we could earn um, that we otherwise wouldn't get to. And, and I probably, as Lou laid out the risk, I don't see the risk so much coming from who we would do the loan with and that that money would come back. I think we could secure ourselves into a pretty good environment there, um, just like we did at the 39th and Rainbow Project when we ended up doing one there. It may, somewhere down the road, there, I mean, there's obviously a risk level. Anytime you make a loan to somebody, will you get it back? But you can look at high levels of pain that it's going to cause somebody if they don't pay you back that money and could really hurt them financially on a lot greater level. So I think that's a, and also if we're, if George has this as a tool, we could work under parameters that we wouldn't bring you a project back that we thought had really any kind of, I mean, more than a marginal level of risk that you're always going to have. The, the risk side that Lou talks about when he talks about what the bond raters do to this and how they look at our overall debt ratio and what that could do to us on an annual basis when they go through and say, well, how much did you put into debt this year? And yeah, one project that's probably, probably doesn't have much impact, if any, four or five, it does. You know, so that, that changes the way we would look at it from that perspective. And I would say, that, and if that hurts our rating, any and we get dinged one or two tenths you know then we're talking well if we made 150,000 here we just spent 200 to 400,000 dollars here annually every year until we can figure out how to get our rating back up and that could be a uh, several years before that could happen even at long after this loan's paid off so those are the two sides of the equation you know that we looked at that I think really brings it back to this table you know it can be a it can be a tool and it's an area, an opportunity for us to increase some revenue. But there is a certain policy risk you have to take when you go to it to say, is that how you want to work with your tax dollars? And I think we can answer questions or whatever from our evaluation. Lou, I'm assuming so you brought this to bond council. Yes. All right. And it, in the, what was their general reaction to this, their gut level reaction to this idea? They thought it was an interesting proposal, um, and, and they said it, uh, it would strictly be, we would have to do it under the home rule authority. It would have to be viewed as an economic uh, development grant. Um, I can't say they were necessarily supportive of it. Uh, would, would, would you say they were cautious, they were resistant? They were um, afraid. I, d I think bond council uh, will work with us to try to structure something under the legal authority that you know uh, that the state allows us to do a financing. I, I guess where um, where I might have had uh, more questions would be from our working with our financial advisor. They 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 felt. Um, I'll say that their support was certainly less favorable, and they, and they viewed it as more adversely. Any other questions, discussion? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Brackovic, if you could help me out. When this issue came up for discussion, we were talking about a project that um, was not as fruitful for small businesses. Uh, as we thought, and this idea rose out of that discussion a month or two ago. 
And I know I was viewing it when I heard it as the type of option that you might do more frequently than the one time. You know, maybe we do four or five times and have this as an opportunity for the UG to make money. But based on what Mr. Levin said, I don't know that I see it that way anymore, that there's a lot more risk to it. And also, you, you use the word developer, Mr. Levin. I thought we, well, did you envision using this for more than just the developers? What about the small businesses? That's the original context. Yeah, in I, which this I, came I up. think small business gets back to the, that last point I met. If, if we had a pool of money and it could be a budgeted amount of money that this commission sets forth, then you're doing it for policy. You're you're saying you have a, you uh, have money available to make loans to small businesses, and it and the reason you want to do it is you want to build small business capacity. And so then you're willing to take a level of risk. Program. I view that as you're not necessarily trying. I guess it, you know what 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 is the main goal or objective of the program? Is the program to generate revenue, that interest spread revenue d differential, or is it to to provide a, a pool that small businesses might be able to use for loans? Yeah. So I have a little different opinion than Lou does. So. <laughs> And Lou, I got to tell you, um, when you talk about the facts of the financing and how it works, um, there seems to be some political opinion in there versus what the financial facts are. So the financial facts are this. When we brought up the lending program, we weren't speaking of small loans originally because I'm the one that brought up the lending program originally mm -hmm. to staff. Um, and let me, let me back up and give a little history here. Um, one of the things we talked about in strategic planning was declining revenues within the unified government and an increase in cost to run our government. That's about as general as I can get for you. And one of the things that the mayor emphasized was how can we creatively broaden our revenue streams and do all these other things like economic development, encourage economic developers to come to our communities and do those kinds of things without putting our good credit rating at risk, okay? So, Gail, I will tell you the reason I didn't consider small microloans is because they tend to be very risky by government standards and by business standards. They're very high risk, okay? So I looked at potentially um, larger loans that were not risky by business standards which um, and by fair market standards um, in order to figure out a way to generate additional revenue back to the unified government. That was the whole intent. So that we could establish through this mechanism a pot of money to do microloans or whatever the commission decides they want to do with that pot of money. It might be buying down the debt. You know, what I heard Lou say, and I also met with bond council, and what I heard Lou say is that um, bond council looks at things like how much debt we have. If we have so much debt that we are concerned about a million or two million dollar loan, we have big trouble in Wyandotte County. So I find it hard to believe that we're concerned about a million or two dollar, um, two million dollar loan. And let's say we did ten of those loans, I would find it concerning if we were worried about ten million dollars of debt. I just, I would, uh, and I think that if we had our bond council and um, our financial advisor here, if we're in that kind of trouble, then I've been on this commission for seven years and I've been gravely misinformed about our financials. And this is the other thing. We, we talk about um, this deal, and let me, let me speak in real terms so that you understand the deal. One of the proposals on the table was a million dollar loan where the borrower would put a personal guarantee up on the million dollars, would pay $150,000 in interest the minute they received the loan in advance, it's like paying all the interest on your car loan in advance. <coughs> and then the loan was a short-term loan 
of three years. There's not a lot that can go wrong in three years, especially with a personal guarantee of the developer. We don't do deals here at the Unified Government ever where we loan money on projects that are that risk adverse. It is true what Doug says, when government gets involved, we get involved because if we don't get involved, then the project doesn't happen. To me, that tells me those de deals are very, very risky. If, if they can't go out and get a bank to loan them the money and they have to come to government and get us to do it and to loan it at 2%, then that deal is very risky. Now, when they talk about, when Lou and Doug talk about policy, this government has taken on some of those projects for what I categorize as no. That just, to me, it is, it is an easy deal. It is a very low risk deal. And, it, and more importantly for me, when, when we just had a meeting a week ago and this government sat around and already is talking about raising our mill levy a mill and a half to pay for security equipment, a mill and a half is about a million and a half dollars. If we could do 10 of these deals where we receive $150,000, we've raised the money for that security equipment without raising the mill levy and increasing taxes for people in this county. I would rather take that risk than continue to ignore opportunity that's out there for this government to make money and raise people's taxes. Raising taxes isn't a strategy to develop you know, long-term revenue streams. So I have a very strong, very different opinion, and I personally am not going to vote for a property tax increase no matter what is on the table. If this government isn't willing to think out of the box, roll up their sleeves, and try some new ways of broadening revenue streams, I'm not raising that mill levy. Now, are we talking about a particular item that's before the board? You mentioned a, a million dollars. I gave you, I gave you an project? example because, oh, okay. Luke, but there is a project that has come to my attention oh, okay. that I think would be a great project. And be clear, Doug is exactly right. This million dollar project. It's going to happen with or without this government. It's not one of those projects that are, we're going to do it for social good. It's going to happen. I simply saw it as an opportunity to develop another revenue stream for our government. Because when people are upset because I won't vote for a property tax increase, I'm going to bring this up again. <laughs> and I'm going to say, well, I tried to help this government expand their revenue portfolio, and they weren't interested in that. So I'm going to bring it up again. I'm just saying, I'm not saying you're voting no on this. I'm just saying so. And, and originally when Doug and I talked about this, we did talk about it being a program. And this is where I think it's a little bit different. I don't think it should be a program. I think we have really quality economic development staff at the Unified Government. We have Greg Kindle, we have George Brakovich, we have Doug. They do a phenomenal job, and I know that because I've worked with them on economic development deals. I think we owe it to them to provide, to let them use some professional discretion on these kinds of deals. And I think they, working with finance, could could bring forward these deals without having a lending program. Maybe there's just a really good deal that's coming forward that it's a, it's a small amount of money that the developer's gonna go out and borrow from the bank, and it's, it's very low risk. If these guys wanna loan in the money and make us some money, they should be allowed to do that in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. Well, I will say it. This puts a whole new light on it, because when I first heard this framed, I thought it was a lending program. And, and for that to take place, I still have questions I want to have answered on that. But you're now talking not something that's a broad policy decision that we make, but something that's very specific, very development-oriented, very unique and one-of-a-kind. And frankly, we're already doing those kinds of things. So. I don't know that we needed this discussion because we're already doing these I things. I completely agree with you. And so, again, excuse me if I misunderstood, but I thought last month when we talked about this, we were talking more broadly 
more globally in terms of a, a lending program that we might undertake that could be applied across the board. And as I said, I still have lots of questions about how that would be actualized. But I guess from my perspective, what I'd say is we're already making these kinds of development decisions in the development agreements we're negotiating and signing Agreed. now. Agreed. I agree with you. I, I just want to be to clarify, to go back to the point you made, uh, that the, the, the UG had set a credit, annual credit limit of 12 to 15 million. That correct, and so you chose 1.2 million as a 10 percent. This is a round number. So it's and, and the problem with giving any loan, taking any of that money and floating a general obligation bond so that we could make specific loans would decrease the amount of money that the UG would then be able to use to do the capital improvements that had been set for the county. You our CMIPs determine on an annual basis. That's right. a, simply a target. You know, it, uh, there's nothing, I'll say, definitive that we couldn't vary it up or down. But that was the target that was set. Yeah. So the the issue still remains that you would reduce. You would you would basically take that money out of the CMIP to be able to float alone, even something as glorious as a 15 percent uh, return on investment for a one million dollar loan. I mean, I guess the other question I would have is that if someone is willing to uh, pay a one hundred fifty thousand pay one hundred fifty thousand dollars in interest up front for a one million dollar loan over three years, they can certainly do better than that in the private market. They can't. They can't get. It depends on what you're borrowing the money for. If you're borrowing it for acquisition, you have one interest rate. If you're borrowing it for renovation or, or rehabilitation, that's a different rate. So, but based upon what you said, if the market is saying that that's a high-risk loan and therefore they don't want to loan money at that rate, why would it be a good idea for the Unified Government to do the same? Am no. I making is I, that a fair I think, question? And I had the same thought, too, when I originally started looking at that. And I talked to three four different developers about this and it is just one that really came in that where it works and it's the way they have their investments when they're coming to their equity portion of their loan and if they're investing their current equity and I and I think that's how I understood that their situation was if they're investing their equity at a higher rate they don't want to pull it out of there they can they can pull it out of there but if they can get it from us for two and a half or three percent then they're making a much larger delta because in the other cases, you know, I mean, it was just a couple percent difference that they're at around 5% or something like that because you have large companies that are trying to invest their money out and they have larger blocks of sums that they can go on short term. And just for a couple of percent, it doesn't work. But when you start to get out there 4% or something like that or 5 then it does work. And I, and I will say, my thought to it is, yeah, as you talk about interest rate, that if you were to proceed down this path, it would be, it's more of a, a loan fee, that you come to it and say, you're going to cover all our cost of issuance, and you're going to cover whatever our interest rate is over this time period, and then you're going to pay us $150,000 as a loan fee in order to do this, because I appreciate where you're going with it to say, let's make some money off of it, if we're going to go to all the work to do it, let's make some money off of it. And I, and one hundred fifty thousand dollars is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money either. You know, so I mean, it has to be enough money to be worth our time. And I believe it's also an analysis that the developers looking at if they can make, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars off this. Well, then it's worth their time because it's money here, and money there. Really, they just have to come out ahead for it to be worth their time. You know, when it when it comes down to something like that. So. That's a, that's a side of it that I guess it would be a parameter without being a real parameter, you know, without a, a policy that we have, but something to go back to and say, if you're going to bring this to us, bring it to us, and it's actually something that's worth their while. Now, I, I want to speak also to your point to Lou on the, because I want to be clear on this, Lou, on the um, annual bond allocation. When we go through our debt projects, and we run that number, and we used to run them up there. We were around 18 million, and we were, and that that looks ahead to what our long-term debt structure is. 
So we go out and we issue our geo notes. And so on an average, you know, we're looking that we're turning, we were bringing back about $18 million in debt. At the time we had, I think, 16 mills dedicated to that, and we were earning over each mill was worth more than a million dollars. Then this, then the bond market dropped, or not the bond market, our valuation dropped, and we fell down below a million in valuation. So that's where we reeled that back and got down below 15 and down to the 13 number that we're working with now. Unfortunately for us, it takes years to get that cycle back caught up, but the objective of the governing body was, hey, we don't want to increase our mill rate that's dedicated toward our debt reserve fund. So it has to stay flat and, and not increase. I believe with this kind of loan program, the objective here is that we're not going to actually issue a bond. We would issue a note for three years and then take that note out. So we would never have to go back toward our bond debt to pay that off. I think it depends if, you, if the program's limit depend on how, how you structure the program. There's no reason if you have such a program that it could be a 10-year loan or a 15-year loan. If you want to limit, certainly if you limit it to uh, just one year, two years, you're, you're, you're limiting your risk, I guess. Okay. Because uh, that, that's an important point to keep in mind. I, and I would say no way would we ever want to take this kind of loan that tapped into what our debt structure would be. Because then the bottom line for you is, if you took that $150,000 that you made off this deal and you spent it today, in four years, I'm going to come back from you, come back to you and say, or five years and say, you need to raise your mill levy at least enough to equal uh, 25 or $30,000 this year to pay this off over this time period that will go out. And that's not where you're going with that's this. Not, you're not trying to increase. Clear, that's not what we're doing. You're not doing. trying to increase our debt burden. <laughs> right. You're just trying to structure a program that takes this out in a and right now, the only right. way I'd see would probably be a, a short term, and I think that would be limited to four years on a note. If we issue a temporary note, we have four, authority up to four years. So when you're in a three-year program, you got a, a year to work it out if there was a problem that would come down the road. But um, Well, I'm glad we had this discussion because it, from my perspective, my recommendation after this discussion would be to let our economic development and finance staff use their professional discretion evaluating all factors yeah. and uh, have this be an allowable tool in their toolbox That's it. If, if, it, if all the factors say we get something of value from the deal then they have the discretion to do that that we don't do anything programmatically and then back to the small business loans, the micro loans that's as different as night and day from what we're talking about here and I would say that, from my perspective, from a policy view, if we want to come back and revisit the micro loan or the small business loan program and how we might pull that off, mm -hmm. I think we can absolutely do it. But it's not this discussion today. But I thought, and we can roll the tape from a couple of weeks ago, that part of this was to raise and then take the money ah, okay. that we get and put that into a pot for microloans. That's how this whole thing started. That's if you right. rolled the tape for a couple we, of weeks we ago. Could. You're right. Actually, we could absolutely do yeah. that, or we could so, we could decide. So, no, I agree with Gail. That's exactly how far we got. Let me back up. I couldn't get, I don't know how to say this, I couldn't get staff beyond the first part of the deal, okay, to make the 150 to use for the microloan. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're right. That's what we talked about. I remember it distinctly also, except the first phase of it was, from my, the way we look at it, is the first phase was, is the lending possible? Is it legal? Mm -hmm. Is the deal a good deal? Is it worth staff's time? There were all those questions. Mm -hmm. So that's the first piece of it. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens, right, I've had this discussion before. So I am willing, because this is what I like to do, go out, work with developers to bring these kinds of deals forward so that there is money coming in. And frankly, I think 150000 on a million dollar investment, on a million dollar loan is a heck of a return. And I think people would be lined up out front to have that deal, especially with a personal guarantee and only for three, over a three year term. So if we can do that multiple times and increase, we won't like this, and, but increase our debt, 
um, but get a larger return where we're bringing in a half a million or a million dollars in revenue, then all I'm going to say is that what we do with that earned revenue would be up, could, could be up to the commission. And all I was saying in the last meeting is that that could be a micro program. It could be a lot of things. It could buy down, Luke could take it all back to buy down the debt. You know, Jim and I talked today that it could also be money that goes to buy down the debt on bad tips. Because by taking care of the debt on bad tips could potentially improve our credit rating and what's going on there that we're not liable for that debt on that tip. I'm not saying it can. I'm saying it's things we can look into. But the other option is to use that money for something like a micro lending program. It depends on where the real concern is, how mm -hmm. we use that money that comes in. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying there's lots of potential yeah. options here. Are we just getting through the first okay. piece of it? Mm -hmm. I think the other part of that discussion came because we brought up the revolving loan fund kind of at the same time, and that's how they... That's they kind of got tied together a little bit. We had the federal program that we are trying to untie ourselves from at this point. And I know George and uh, Charles have had discussions with the feds about whether or not we can get some of our money out of that, mm -hmm. which if we try to tie getting our money out of it to go right into a revolving loan fund but under our administration maybe is an opportunity that allows us to get it out. You know, obviously if we get it out and there's nothing – ties to it, then it just comes back and you all can say, put it in the general fund, we'll decide what we'll do with it during the summer. Yes. So it all depends, and I don't, we haven't got that release yet or the word on how that's working, but I think that's how we kind of tied these two issues together and they are completely separate. So I mean. But they're in steps. Um, I think, and I think we've looked, I, I will say this, I mean those kind of small loan programs are very labor intensive. And they are high risk. So, I mean, that's a different kind of money. And, of course, we're talking about different levels of dollars. If you put $500,000 in that program, you have to be willing to think, I may not get that $500,000 back. But I'm going to try to, we're going to do it in a way that we get, we do good things with it during that time frame. And, you know, the chances that you don't get it all back are low. But just like we have had, but this program's gone since when, Charles, 1985? There was, you know, money put into it, and it's continued to revolve and revolve. And over that time, we've had a, here's a loan for twenty-five thousand dollars, and the, somebody went belly up, and we didn't, we got three thousand back out of it. On the flip side, we've got loans that pay it all back, and we've earned more interest back over the the past thirty years than we've definitely put into it. So, the, it's worked. It's just we can't get the parameters that are in the federal program now are just too tight to make it work. Brian, sure. um, <clears throat> I support this project uh, and, and uh, look forward to the staff sort of fleshing it out a little bit. But at the end of the day, I do believe we need a written policy, not a program, right. but you know, one of the policies, like the the whole list that we approved just a few weeks ago at at the commission meeting. Um, and I know we're going to be looking more at the TIF policy to you know maybe expand on that a little bit, but rather than just rely on the meeting minutes for this meeting to chart a course forward, I do believe we need to come up with a written policy and um, go from there. What would you think about trying, since we're going to be revisiting the TIF policy anyway, mm -hmm. since that is a policy on economic development tools, for lack of, I'm not sure that's how it's phrased in the policy, but is it possible that we could articulate a short directive that is kind of broad and in that, in the subsection of that policy, because it has several headings dealing with the various economic development tools. You mean the, the lending tool, could, are you saying? Correct. What would you say? That the lending tool that we've just discussed here yes. could then be listed in the economic development policy as one of the subheadings oh, absolutely. and the potential yep. options absolutely. for economic development. Absolutely, like, like IRBs exactly. and TIF, and exactly. then it would say lending. UG lending, and again, it would articulate what we've talked about here, where economic development staff, finance staff, consider all the variables and... Yes. So is that... 
yeah, I, I guess it's a matter of one, if if I'm hearing what seems to be a direction of consensus from this group, understanding you want a policy to come with it, but mm -hmm. I mean, we have an opportunity right now to try to mold this with the one project that we're working and could bring something back and have the parameters tied around it, you know, as to far as how that would work, you know, how, and say it's hard to write a policy about something if I've never done it. Yeah, but I, what I was hearing were a lot of principles like three or four years maximum loan. Okay. Uh, there might be a maximum dollar amount somehow. There might be a demand of a personal guarantee. There might be uh, a demand of first position in the payback of, or the debt. Or, you know, there, there are several, I think, little elements that we've talked about that could be put together. You know, those policies that we have now are not real specific. Yeah, they, yeah. they leave a lot of latitude. We could probably bring that back with it. If, you know, I, I would say if this project works, we'd probably be back on the next next month's agenda. Yeah. Um, stating here it is and we're ready to roll if that project flows. But we could also have those policies, yeah, like that laid out. Um, well, given the fact that we've already done some some lending, some borrowing, you know, in the context of some other economic development deals we've done. We really have the broad umbrella that I would that I would think covers this particular mm -hmm. specific instance. So under that broad umbrella, ask our staff to use their best discretion in putting together another deal, then use lessons learned from that to articulate a little bit tighter policy related to the specifics of lending being a tool. Seem reasonable. Yeah. So to use the broad umbrella that we really kind of already used, and then sharpen our focus with this test case. Yeah, and only I would add agree with all of this. The only thing I would add, you have to be able to do it. So, so make sure that. It's not something, I mean, developers going to look at it and go, oh, that's pretty, but I can't use it. I mean, right. it has to be practical. Yeah. So that's why I like what Jim and Brian both said. We've already sort of got the parameters based on what the current developer has brought forward. If, if a real-life developer is saying, I'll give you a personal guarantee, I'll pay the interest on the front end, it's apparently exciting to them. And so, and, that, and it's good for us as far as it's, I think, 150000 on a million dollars in three years is immediately, and then over three years paid back, is a great deal for us. Heck, I loan it to them if I had it. Um, but, uh, so I would just say those might be some good initial parameters that then could be promoted throughout other developers. Then we know it's workable. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yes, ma'am. You throw in there for just consideration to how many of these, would there be a limit to the time period or the number of these that we can do in a year? And my, my concern would be what a deal like that, because of the money that may be involved, might do to our bond rating at any time. Right. You know, um, and I think that those would all be things that we'd have to factor in mm -hmm. and certainly Doug and George and Lou and the rest of the team have much more insight into how all of that plays. And they'd have to, at the end of the day, they'd have to make a deal, like they do in any development agreement, that works for everybody. Right. Right. Because you're right, Gail. I don't want it to affect our so bond rating either. Yeah. I mean, we do need to come up with an idea of, you know, yeah. when would that be affected. Right. You know? Yeah. However, I would be disappointed if they set it at $5 million and then someone comes in front of us and asks us for $10 million for a social good project. I'm just telling you, I would be disappointed by that because to me that doesn't make any sense. So is that something you think Do you we know can? what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Like you said, you just have to look at the project when it right. comes. Right, that's right. We can work on that and, okay. and, and evolve it. And I think, see, and that's where I struggle with the whole bond rating one. It's just, it's... It's an un, I mean, yeah, if it's big numbers, we know it, 
and I said that at the beginning of the meeting when I entered. If it's, it's a one million or two projects, I'm confident that's not going to have an impact. We go out and do seven or eight, then it starts to get some attention that it's looked at, and if you continue to do it. Now, I'd also say just on a capacity level and number of projects coming in, I don't think that's a concern I have right off the bat, okay. that we're just going to have so many of these pumping through all the time. I mean, if that's the case, then we're probably going to come back to you and ask for a chunk of that money to add somebody on the staff to be able to handle it because I don't know how we can do it. Can't you outsource that, though, and charge the developer to pay for the, like when you verify the personal guarantee and stuff like that, can't you outsource that? And so you don't even have to mess with it internally. Potentially. Yeah. And, and in fact, I would say in verifying personal wealth, we will do that. Yeah. Because they're, and then we will just get a letter back to us that says the financial stability of someone like that. Because when you're looking at personal wealth, if... George and Lou went out and did that and came back with all their records and everything, then it's immediately open record. And not everybody wants to have all their personal wealth just available to the entire public to go through. Um, so that's where we will bring in a, a competent firm that will go do that analysis for us and then write us a letter that comes back onto it. That's great. Okay. So you will bring back as many specifics as, as you can for the next time, and then we'll fold this discussion into our policy discussion, whether it occurs next month or the month after that. Sounds good, good to me. George, you ought to have, what, four or five projects ready with this next month? <laughs> <laughs> Almost four to five. You've got, you've got two and a half weeks to get them on the agenda. <laughs> now, that could be a problem. <laughs> No, you can just blue sheet them in. I learned something new today, pink sheet. So. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if there, is there any more discussion? Mr. Brockman. I just wanted to uh, step back a little bit on the lie tech. I wanted to <clears throat> make sure, actually I didn't say it, so I apologize. There is one lie tech project that we are going to be reviewing. But there is a light tech project that has been in the works for three or four months now, and that is cross line towers. So I just want to make sure that, you know, it's won't, well, because it will be coming to uh, standing committee again, either March or April. Why I thought that, that had already gone through. We already it approved back? that. It came to yeah. full commission. Yeah. That was the one where I nope. wanted to vote no, and they would, said it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, might as well just lay it out there. <laughs> I know we brought it. I'd have to look I back and see. I guess I would qualify that as one if we haven't done final that it's already in the system for us. Yeah. So I could have sworn we had already discussed yeah. that. Oh, that, that was, excuse me, Commissioner. Uh, I believe that that was Tartan Residential and that Bob Hughes was there because he's the yeah, universal Gail management. Yeah, just filled me in. That's right. So, but this is the, they are actually totally remodeling the uh, cross line towers. Oh, uh, what happened but was, remember we brought the garage? Yeah. Yeah. That was Steve yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we brought the garage component yes. to say we would allow them to couple that into their deal. That's, That's what you The yeah. MOU. And actually, that's the project. Yeah. 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 So I just wanted to make sure yeah. that, okay. I mean, Thank I didn't you. want to yeah. surprise yeah. you with Appreciate that. it. Yeah. Thanks for okay. clarifying, yeah. Charles. great. Well, it's come that time. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.